Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where tonight we're talking all things political. And unlike the things you've been seeing on the news, we're going to have a debate, I think, with civility. So we're going to be talking about money, money, policy, lots of other issues, but we're going to have fun and we're going to talk in a civil manner. So that'll be kind of a change of pace from what you've been seeing on the national news. I'd like to start the show tonight with a little piece by Annie Cook on politics. Governor Tim Pawlenty will not be going for term number three, but he has one more year to serve, and it could be a tough one. I want to emphasize, I think most people, most economists, most forecasters are expecting another budget deficit in November when the budget deficit is released. As I speak with people involved in government, there is a common theme throughout. We're not out of the woods quite yet. Though 2009 was tough, 2010 could prove to be even more challenging. For the past budget, the governor used his power of unallotment to keep his promise of no new taxes. The governor is strongly, I think rightly, uh, opposed to any state tax increases. Something his opposition doesn't exactly agree with. I think Minnesotans are catching on that no new taxes just meant their property taxes went up too far. The taxation debate will inevitably continue into the next legislative session as elected officials from both parties continue to deal with the recession. I think the single biggest force in government is inertia. Uh, things tend to move very, very slowly until something drastic happens. And another multi-billion dollar budget deficit could be the drastic situation that triggers some major action at the state level. For Lakeland News at 10, I'm Annie Cook. I'd like to welcome my guest this evening, uh, State Senator Paul Coring from District tw uh, Senate District 12, and he actually is from Brainerd. And, Fort Ripley, uh, actually, Ray. Pardon? Fort, Fort Ripley. Fort Ripley, but we can call it the Brainerd House. <laughs> <Florida. laughs> right. And Senator Dan Scogan, who is from Senate District 10, and actually lives in Hewitt, and for people who may not be familiar with he where Hewitt is, it's roughly 45 miles west of the Brainerd area, or 9 or 10 miles south of Wadena. That's correct. And also tonight, a co-host with me is Mike O'Rourke, who is back with us again for the third or fourth time, uh, associate editor of the Brainerd Dispatch. Welcome uh, back, Mike. It's good Thank to you. have all of you on the program. Thank you. If I may start with the first question, um, it's, a, it's a comment that I heard on the radio about two weeks ago. And it was a political scientist from one of the, ma the major universities in Minnesota, or the, it wasn't the University of Minnesota, but one of the private colleges, rather. And he said, part of our, the big problem that we're facing in the state right now is the budgeting process that we use is obsolete. In the high technology and the fast pace of how we work, the way we do the budgets just doesn't work anymore. Do you have any feelings about that? Well, I do, and I've, I've talked about this before. Uh, I think we need to go to a zero-based budgeting formula where uh, you start, instead of, uh, the previous biennium, uh, the state of Minnesota would spend $34 billion. And then, so then traditionally, the legislature would come back and that would be the starting point. We'd start at that $34 billion and then go on from there. I think we need to have zero-based budgeting. That means that we start from zero and we build from there. That means every single program gets scrutiny and you go up from there. Rather than having it be uh, inflationary increases uh, where you know the, the budget was projected actually to grow to 37 billion dollars and um, I, I think that's a formula that, that we need to look at Ray. So yeah I think uh, I think Paul's on to something I don't know that we can do that level of scrutiny in a two-year period uh, to be uh, constitutionally balanced every two years is difficult although I think uh, to some degree the way we budget and spend 34 billion dollars uh, is not a very good way we do it uh, you know, you break it down to how you budget at, at home. And then I've been in business and we had a budget that uh, uh, was flexible. And, uh, and then you uh, think about uh, my time spent at Dodwadeen Electric Co-op and how we budgeted there. And this is not a very good way to spend $34 billion. It, it's difficult. I forgot to, to say this in the introduction, but Senator Coring is a Republican mm -hmm. and Senator Scogan is a Democrat. And it's nice to see that there are Democrats and Republicans who can sit down and have good discussions about the budgets. Doesn't mean you necessarily agree on that, but 
Um, there's a group of people led by Arnie Carlson as one of them and, and Congressman, former Congressman Tim Penny, who is suggesting that a number of people get together with the governor and talk about the next biennium, which is, I think they're talking about a potential $7 billion shortfall in the next biennium. And I see that this week the governor sort of uh, said he wasn't going to be a part of that because he felt that if there was going to be process, uh, progress made rather, it should be in the process of using the legislature that's here now and trying to solve that problem by giving him proposals and, and act upon that. Do you, do you have any responses to that? Well, I like to be respectful of his decision not to participate in that. I think they're calling it an economic summit uh, at the state level. He certainly, that's his prerogative. Uh, but uh, really what has occurred, I think, is he's kind of kicked the can down the road the last couple of years. Uh, he is philosophically appro opposed to any new revenue. At the same time, uh, we've seen property taxes rise by over $3 billion while he's been in office, and we've also uh, seen fees and, and licensures uh, go up uh, by millions of dollars. I think the time to have the summit, you know, if we're going to put some of the the blame on uh, my leadership as well. The time to have that summit was right as the session was ending, before he went through his unallotment process. In fact, uh, as the session came to a close, I sent him a letter and asked him, I could see what his unallotments would do to greater Minnesota. And I asked him to have a uh, uh, bipartisan meeting with uh, uh, people from just greater Minnesota to talk about the impact about of what he was about to do. Uh, he unfortunately didn't respond to that. Uh, le leadership on my side of the aisle now has asked him to come to a summit, although they have invited uh, former leaders from both parties, I guess, to be there. But uh, uh, he doesn't want to do that, and and uh, that is his prerogative. I wish he would uh, come to the table and talk about it, but he's choosing not to. Uh, Senator, on, speaking of unallotments, what's to stop uh, Governor Plenty from going that route again, and would you favor any restrictions on uh, the, the governor's ability to make unallotment cuts? Well, and not just Governor Plenty, but any uh, governor. Mm -hmm. I, th I think uh, the unallotment process was put in place and was designed for emergency situations and not for bu a budgeting tool. I think he, uh, although is probably within the parameters of the law in what he did, I think uh, the intent of that piece of legislation was maybe. Uh, misused there. And uh, so, I, uh, yeah, would he do that again? I think he would if he felt the need to do that again. I, I, I guess I do. Would either of you favorite restrictions from preventing him to or limiting the power somewhat? No, no, not at all. I think uh, if you look at what the governor is doing, actually the governor is doing, and I know there's a lot of people that are upset with him, actually the governor is doing the job that, that he swore an oath to do. Uh, in the Constitution, there's the uh, unallotment provision. Uh, the, uh, the majority party, which is not the Republican Party in the legislature, uh, sent him uh, budget bills that put us $3 billion out of balance. And so when July, the new biennium uh, started in July 1st, he had no choice but to unallot. And so, you know, I know a lot of people are critical of the governor, but I, I think if you look and listen to what the governor has tried to do over his, the last seven years, to me, what, the, what is the most important thing you can have right now, today? A job. A job. That's what the governor has been trying to do, is make Minnesota conducive to businesses that want to move here. If you have one of the highest business taxes, in, not only in the country, but in the world, businesses are not going to move here. And if you, if you go out with your shorts on in January, you're going to find out that it's not a very attractive place to want to move here in the wintertime. Go down to 3M. And 3M will tell you right now that they are not expanding anything in Minnesota. Businesses are moving away. Yeah, I think we have a good educational system here in Minnesota, but kids get out of school, students get out of school, and there's no jobs. What the governor has been trying to do is trying to make Minnesota a more business-friendly state. And, um, and, and I think he's on the right track. Uh, you know, and as far as the unallotment, he's, he's doing what his constitutional job is. And we're out of balance and, and um, you know, uh, I certainly think he's done a, an admirable job. Well, if I could follow up on one of your points, Paul, is you're right. He, um, we sent him, it, the legislature sent him uh, budget bills that were about $3 billion mm -hmm. uh, out of balance. And he signed all those. 
Mm -hmm. And then we sent him the tax bill that paid for it, and he vetoed that. Mm -hmm. So he put in place all of the spending, but wouldn't give us the money to pay for it. Well, I, I, I think Minnesota is a high enough tax state. Um, you, you go to other states uh, all the way around us, and, and uh, South Dakota is booming. North Dakota has a surplus. And uh, this notion that if we think we're going to tax our way to prosperity, it's not going to work. This country is so far in debt right now, and I think that's what's happening. The chickens are coming home to roost right now. I think my final comment on your question is I would like to see some changes made in, in the unallotment process for whatever party uh, holds the governor's mm -hmm. position. The state had to make severe budget cuts last year, and November's budget forecast is expected to show another budget shortfall. And everyone seems to think we've made all the easy cuts. Without raising taxes, what more can be cut? What can we do when you folks convene? Well, I still think that, that there's, there's fat to trim. Um, I think that we could ask people, you know, before we went on the air, I asked about the Brainerd Dispatch. Uh, all the employees there had to take a 7% cut. Uh, go and talk to the seven or 800 people that have been laid off down at Larson Boats. Ask them if they can pay any more taxes. They can't. And so I think we're going to have to go to the state employees. We're going to have to start thinking outside of the box uh, on how we're going to get things in balance. But I think uh, just continually piling more taxes on people to think that that's going to get us out of this problem, that's not going to work. You know, I think it's estimated that in that next biennium there might be a 20% shortfall, mm -hmm. which is what that $7 billion amount is. And if there are no new revenues, and you say that there could be more fat trimmed, how do you trim $7 billion? What, what do you see as the way of doing that? How do you get out of that? 